Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, today, we are excited to have Dr. Ignacio Portadas Castillo uh, here with us to give us an excellent talk. So Dr. Portadas Castillo uh, earned his medical degree from the Universidad Autónoma de San Luis Potosi in San Luis Potosi, Mexico. After graduating, he actually worked as a family doctor in a rural, uh, rural community in Mexico for a year, providing care for up to about 1,000 people in this community. Uh, after that year, he then did internal medicine residency at Rochester's General Hospital, uh, but followed by nephrology fellowship at Brigham and Women's and Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And then in 2022, he joined us here as assistant professor in division of nephrology. Dr. Portales Castillo's interests lie in the realm of bone mineral disease, especially in parathyroid function in the context of kidney disease. As a fellow in Boston, he worked in the endocrinology unit at MGH, focusing on parathyroid hormone receptor function. Then after joining faculty here, he's been working alongside Dr. Roberto uh, Civitelli in the division of bone and mineral disease to further explore the role of parathyroid hormone. Today, uh, he will be sharing with us some of his work on this topic and the implication it has on our clinical work. So please help me welcome Dr. Portales Castillo to Grand Rounds. Okay, um, thank you so much for the introduction. So uh, my topic today is called Molecular Insights into the Parathyroid, Parathyroid-Related Peptide Receptor Function Lead to Novel Clinical Applications. Okay, I don't have any disclosures to share here. And I'm going to talk about three parathyroid analogs, three drugs that can be used in clinical practice, and I'm going to use them to discuss three topics here, hypoparathyroidism, osteoporosis, and then rare genetic variants of the PTH receptor. This talk is not an exhaustive review of any of these conditions or all their available treatments, but I want to use the example of three, these three drugs and how we can apply it to clinic to talk about the molecular mechanisms of PTH, PTHRP, and how they inform our use for now clinical practice. First, I want to tell you how did I get to, into this topic of PTH molecular mechanisms. So my first exposure was actually to a disease called calciphylaxis when I was an internal medicine resident and a nephrology fellow. This is a devastating disease that happens mainly in patients that have um, kidney disease. And I was, um, I discussed with Dr. Sagar Niwekar, who was able to then uh, recruit me to MGH to continue training. But then it was clear to me that nobody knew what was going on with calciphylaxis or most of other things related to the kidney and bone. So is it too little PTH, is it too much PTH, or what is going on here? So to try to understand more about how the parathyroid receptor works, I went to uh, ask for uh, help at the MGH endocrinology unit, and that's where I met Dr. Jubner and Dr. Gardella, who brought me into this field of uh, PTH receptor function. So after a um, couple of work with them and interactions, I started forming a small part of this story that I want to tell you about today. First, I want to start with a question for the topic here. So I want to give you a few seconds to scan this QR code and just tell me a little bit about this. Okay, so now I'm going to read aloud the question and it, and it says, what is correct about PTHRP? Option A, it's just basically the same as PTH. Option B, well, it's relevant because it's high when somebody has hypercalcemia or malignancy. Option C, is present in the mammary gland and skin. And here I can see in my computer that 77% said it's relevant because it's high in hypercalcemia or malignancy. And 16%, now 14% said, well, it's also present in the mammary gland and skin. Okay, so I'm going to answer this question as I go along the slides. First, PTH and PTHRP are not the same, but what is remarkable, I think, about them is that they both use the same receptor to exert their functions. 
The receptor is the PTH receptor, and it's a G-protein coupled receptor. Just like any other G-protein coupled receptor, it has these seven transmembrane domains and signals usually through cyclic AMP. But the biologic functions are very different. PTH is more important for calcium and phosphorus homeostasis, while PTHRP actually is more relevant for organ development, in particular bone development, mammary gland, and skin. How do they achieve this? Well, PTH is secreted from the parathyroid glands. It has to travel through the bloodstream, and then it reaches the receptor in the kidneys and bones. So it's an endocrine hormone. PTHRP, on the other hand, is secreted right next to where the receptor is. It's a paracrine factor. Here on top, I show a growth plate. So the chondrocytes at the edge of the plate have the, um, a lot of PTHRP, and the receptor is right below them. And so there is this very fine coordination between ligand and receptor that allows the growth plate to grow and then form bone. And then a similar thing happens in the skin and at the mammary gland. There is a very tight coordination between ligand and receptor, very close together. So what is correct about PTHRP? Well, it's present in mammary gland and skin. It's not the same as PTH, although it looks very similar. And yes, it's relevant because it's high in hypercalcemia of malignancy, but biological is much more important for organ development, I would argue. Um, so these are the three drugs that I'm going to talk to you about today and how can we use them on a clinical practice or how are they being developed. The number one is called LAPTH, and it's a form of PTH that lasts very long, just like a marathon. Number two, it's a pit form of PTH that acts very quickly on the receptor. It's called a valoparathite, just like a sprint. And the number th three drug that I'm going to talk to you about is a form of a PTH analog that makes the receptor actually go in the other way, so decrease its function. So it's an inverse agonist. And the three diseases I'm going to use to exemplify these are hypoparathyroidism, osteoporosis, and then gain-of-function genetic diseases. Let's start with the first one, hypoparathyroidism. Hypoparathyroidism is basically having low circulating parathyroid hormone. You can get this either from uh, surgical reasons, like surgical parathyroidectomy, or from autoimmune diseases that result in destruction of the gland, or from genetic diseases that cause either malformation of the parathyroid gland or activating uh, mutations in the calcium sensitive receptor which prevent PTH to be released to the blood. The clinical manifestations of hypoparathyroidism are hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, low vitamin D, and at the bone there is low bone turnover, and there is a high density in the bone, but there is low quality. And there is a controversial increase in fracture risk as well. Why, why do hypoparathyroidism cause these clinical manifestations? Well, we have to review what is, again, the normal PTH physiology. PTH is secreted from the parathyroid glands, goes to the kidney, and what it does in the kidney is it promotes the synthesis of vitamin D, 1 to 25. This leads to an increase in the calcium absorption from the intestines. But in the kidney, the other uh, important action of PTH is that it promotes calcium reabsorption. So when it promotes calcium reabsorption, it makes more of the calcium stay in the blood and less of the calcium in the urine. In the bone, PTH increases bone turnover. These actions are all aimed at maintaining calcium levels. But besides that, it also causes phosphaturia, which prevents hyperphosphatemia. So from these actions that we know that PTH is important to maintain calcium, the lack of PTH leads to hypocalcemia. And the ma clinical manifestations can be seizures, can be um, arrhythmias, muscle problems. The conventional treatment for treating patients with hypoparathyroidism is giving calcium and calcitroil. 
This is effective in that you can restore the calcium levels and prevent some of these clinical manifestations. But there is a problem with the, with the conventional treatment, and that is that if you don't have PTH in the kidney, so if you simply increase the calcium levels in the blood, all the calcium or a lot of it goes to the, to the kidneys. And, and this calcium in the kidneys cause kidney stones and eventually can lead to renal failure. So a very common complication of hypoparathyroidism treated with calcium and calcitriol is to get kidney failure. So what you want to do in this case is not only replace the calcium, but ideally you want to replace the missing hormone so that it doesn't lead to kidney failure. How can you achieve this? Well, a simple way will be just giving back the hormone. There is a PTH1284, which is the normal hormone, and you can inject the hormone. There is also PTH1234, which is basically a short version of the normal hormone, but it retains all the activity. So you could simply give back this hormone, inject it, and it's effective at raising the calcium levels, as you would expect. The problem comes that this hormone only lasts a few hours in the blood. So you could inject maybe once, twice a day, perhaps a bit more, and it's very hard to maintain the normal levels of calcium through the day. So in order to overcome this problem, just over the last few years, there was the development of a sustained release form of PTH called palopec parathyte. This is a still similar to the, to the normal hormone, it's just that it released over the 24 hours. And this hormone, this new drug is effective. Almost every patient that, ha that was on this hormone in the clinical study was able to maintain calcium levels with no more need for calcium and calcitriol. And it was also effective at improving the kidney function. And this is because the hormone was able to reduce the calcium in the urine and prevent this nephrocalcinosis. So I think it's a great step forward. However, there is still a problem with this. And the problem is that I'm focusing a lot on what are the effects on the kidney, but what happens when you inject this hormone and then what happens in the bone? So the actions of PTH in the bone are a little bit complex, the normal actions, and I'm going to illustrate them here. So normally PTH in the bone goes and acts on osteoblast here. The osteoblasts are cells that form bone, so the action initially of PTH in the bone is to promote bone formation. However, if there is a continuous exposure to PTH in the bone, the osteoblast will communicate with osteoclast to rank ligand and promote bone resorption. So in other words, if you have a short action of PTH in the bone, there will be bone formation. But if the PTH is continuously secreted, there will be bone resorption. How does this make sense? Why would the body have a hormone that builds and destroys bone? Well, it's probably because the main action of PTH is to maintain calcium levels in the blood. So when you don't need the calcium, it may be leading to more bone formation because you, you build the storage that you will need for the future when you need to re resorb it and bring calcium but you require a very coordinated system that is able to, at all times, sense how, what are the levels needed of PTH. How can you achieve that with a drug that you are simply going to inject it and expect that it will be the same at all times in the day? So the question is, what is the effect of this new drug on the bone? And this is still an ongoing story. It was just this year, just this year the preliminary studies came. The preliminary results show that this a new drug, this new sustained release form of PTH, increases the bone turnover, so it affects the bone, although later on in the clinical study, the markers of bone turnover decrease. What do I want to say with all this? Well, this new drug has a strong effect on the bone. It's leading the bone to start uh, forming more and then forming uh, less as, this, uh, as there's more time of exposure. My worry here, or the problem, is that we don't know what are the effects on these patients over the long term. Patients with hypoparathyroidism might need this their whole life, and we don't yet know what will be the effect on their, on their bones. 
So what alternatives do we have? I would say that if we were to design a PTH replacement for these patients, we would ideally want this PTH analog to be very active on the kidney, to be able to prevent renal failure and to promote calcium um, reabsorption. But we probably don't want too many effects on the bone, or at least we want more balanced effects where there is formation and resorption. How could we develop such a drug that restores the calcium levels without having too much bone effects? One way to do it will be simply to try to design a drug that can go directly to the kidney and not go to the bone. But so far, we haven't achieved that. However, by looking at the molecular mechanism of how the receptor normally works, we have been gaining insights in how we can achieve just this, going more after the kidney and less after the bone. So I'm going to spend a few slides talking about molecular mechanism to rationalize this drug synthesis. So I hope I don't lose you too fast with these molecular mechanisms. <laughs> okay, so here is the slide where I'm talking about molecular mechanisms and how kidney and bone actions may differ at the cellular level. So right on the plasma membrane, we have the receptor. When a ligand comes to the receptor, it binds to the G protein. That's what all GPCRs do. And then this would stimulate the formation of cyclic AMP. And this happens in bone cells, in kidney cells, everywhere. The difference is that also what happens is that when the ligand comes to the receptor, the receptor gets internalized into endosomes. And here, if the ligand and receptor interactions are strong, even within endosomes, even inside the cell, the ligand and the receptor remain bound, and they are still able to produce cyclic AMP intracellularly. And so the cyclic AMP response will be longer than, for example, if the ligand, once it comes to the endosomes, it comes out of the receptor. And this endosomal signaling produces a second pool of cyclic AMP. And from preclinical studies, molecular and animal studies, that I'm not going to go in depth with, we have learned that this endosomal signaling is particularly important to create effects in the kidney. And it's not so relevant to create effects on the bone. So if we're able to do more endosomal, more prolonged cyclic AMP signaling, we may be able to reach the kidney without having so much strength in the bone. And I'm going to show you some data about it. I want to also mention that this inspiration of the endosomal signaling and how it may or not may be relevant came from looking at the normal biologic actions of PTH and PTHRP. So both join the receptor here, but PTH is a stronger ligand than PTHRP, and when it comes to the endosomes, PTH is still right where the receptor is, and it still promotes cyclic AMP, so it has this long cyclic AMP signaling. While PTHRP is weaker, and when it's internalized, it comes off the receptor, and this allows the, the cyclic AMP duration to be short. So this prolonged versus short signaling already happens biologically. And if you remember in the first slide, I show you how PTH has to travel all the way to the blood to reach an organ that is far away. And so it's designed to be stronger, to be able to find something and bind stronger. PTHRP acts in cells that are right next to it. So it has to have a more fine coordination where it acts, it stops, it acts, so that it allows this fine tuning. So these are already difference that exist physiologically. And we are now exploiting them to be able to rationalize the drugs that we want to develop for the specific treatments. Here I'm showing you how these cellular um, differences make a difference biologically. This graph was made uh, using a humanized mouse. What is a humanized mouse? A humanized mouse is a mouse that has the P human PTH receptor. We replace the mouse receptor, we put a human receptor so that we know that it will have the actions that you would expect in patients. If you inject 
PTH in blue, you increase the calcium from baseline to a significant increase at two hours. You wait a few more hours and the calcium is still high. If you inject PTHRP, you also in increase the calcium, but it doesn't last long. After a few hours, it's back to uh, low. So the difference in increased cyclic AMP having more duration also affects the calcium response. And if we want to develop a treatment for a patient that has hypoparathyroidism and we need to maintain calcium levels, we want to have responses that last longer at the cyclic AMP level so that we can achieve the biologic uh, changes we want. So the first analog that was developed was this LAPTH, long-acting PTH. And this is another slide of how this LAPTH, how these drugs will uh, develop, how the molecular mechanism works. So here, the ligand PTH will come to the receptor in green. Now, the ligand, the PTH, in, goes into the receptor, and it will start the signaling through this G protein. This is what I showed you in the previous slides, but now I'm showing here ligand, receptor, and G protein. What makes the difference between a strong and weak ligands is what happened next. A strong ligand can then go back without the G protein because the G protein went away to produce cyclic AMP. And a strong ligand will still remain bound to the receptor like PTH. A weaker ligand like PTHRP, without the G protein, the interaction is too unstable and will come off the receptor. So the strong ligand is able to remain bound to the receptor and go through different cycles of G protein coupling to produce a longer signaling. And this was coined as an R0 conformation. R0 means that there's a receptor, but nothing else, no G protein. And this is to distinguish it from RG, which is the receptor with the G protein. So if we want to design a drug that lasts longer, it's targeting this R0, it's making the ligand stay there when the G protein is not, what will allow us to have this prolonged cyclic AMP signaling. And this is what explains why PTH and PTHRP are different. Here I'm showing a graph of binding studies where you have PTH in a circle and PTHRP in a square. In the minus 12, we see that the two ligands bind very well to the receptor. But if you add a molecule called GTP, which will displace the G protein and leave the receptor alone, more unstable, PTH in circle, black circles, remains bound, but PTHRP does not remain bound. So the difference why one can signal longer and the other not is because one is sensitive to the G protein being there and the other doesn't. And what is very interesting in terms of developing these drugs is that the key difference between PTH and PTHRP amino acid sequence is a position five. PTH has an isoleucine and PTHRP and histidine. And if you just change that amino acid, just put an isoleucine on PTHRP, you can make it behave like a PTH. So only these very fine amino acid changes make a difference in how this um, ligands behave in the receptor. And this was the rationale behind these drugs that uh, last longer. So you would design a drug that has an isoleucine at position five, just like PTH, and you would make any other modification necessary to make it stronger. This will allow drugs to be stronger at the R0 conformation when there is no G protein. So in these graphs, you see PTH in blue. It's a displacement uh, curve. When you go to the right, it means weaker. So PTHRP is displaced to the right. It needs higher doses, it's weaker. But then you design a drug called LAPTH that is even stronger than the endogenous PTH. And this, you, you see that the binding level, and here you see that the cyclic AMP level. So these drugs, like LAPTH, are here on top because even after hours and hours that you inject them, they still are producing cyclic AMP, while even the normal PTH has already finished its signaling after 40 minutes or so. So going from the understanding of how these G-protein interactions go, 
to how the, it affects the binding, to how it affects the duration of cyclic AMP, allow to rationalize the use of the, uh, the development of this drug. What are the effects now in animal models and then finally in humans? Let's take a look at how they behave in animal models. This is a model of hypoparathyroidism in rats. So here, the black graph is a normal rat, and it has normal calcium levels. If you take total parathyroidectomy in gray, the rat has now low calcium levels. Now you inject different amounts of this, basically LAPTH analog, and you increase the calcium levels in the para, uh, hypoparathyroid rat. You can also increase calcium levels by giving vitamin D, just like you will do in a human. At 24 hours, both giving the drug or the uh, vitamin D increase calcium levels in the blood as you would expect in humans. But the difference is that when you give vitamin D, the urine calcium is very high because all the calcium is going from the blood into the urine. While if you give the drug because it acts on the kidney, you are able to maintain the calcium in the blood and do not waste calcium in the urine. So you are targeting what we think is the reason for renal failure in these patients. How is this drug now behaving in clinical trials? These are just from a few months ago, and the drug is now called enevoparathide. And what we see here is that over almost three months, injecting once a day this drug is able to maintain calcium levels normally in persons with hypoparathyroidism. And there is a reduction almost entirely of the need to give either calcium or vitamin D. So the drug works, similar to the other sustained release form of, um, of PTH. What is interesting about this drug is that it doesn't cause too many bone changes. It's just a mild increase in bone anabolism and reabsorption. So just these balance changes in the bone that you want to. Now, you could ask me, why is that? I mean, at the end of the day, it will also go to the bone, and it should cause uh, bone changes as well. It's not entirely clear, but it's possible that because it's more specific to this endosomal signaling, because it's so strong that you need lower doses that may have all the effects on the kidney, it may be that some of these uh, conditions allow it to be more favorable for the effects you want to cause but we still need to know the long-term consequences of using this or the sustained release form of PTH for these patients. So I'm going to finish that part of the talk here and summarize saying that, well, in hypoparathyroidism, you have hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. You usually uh, treat with calcium and calcitriol, and that works well for um, at least to restore the calcium. The problem begins that this may lead to renal failure. And now we know that you need PTH analogs that are or more there in the blood or that are signaling for a longer time due to the properties of binding this R0 conformation in order to maintain calcium levels for a more uh, prolonged time in the normal range. So I spoke about this long-acting, and now I'm going to speak about how the opposite, a short-acting drug, may also be useful in clinical practice, but for a different disease called osteoporosis. So let's go to that. Osteoporosis is a common problem. It affects about one-third of postmenopausal women. It's characterized by fragility fractures or low bone density. And in simple terms, what happens is there is less bone formation than there is bone resorption. There are two kinds of drugs that you can use for osteoporosis. You could either increase the bone formation by giving things like PTH or romosuzumab, or you could decrease bone resorption. So it's just sort of two ways to treat this. I'm going to, of course, focus on the use of PTH analogs. But I'm going to tell you that the first line as of today is still to give anti-resorptive fares because they are having there for a longer time, they are cheap, they are effective, although there are specific scenarios when you want to use anabolic medicines, and that's particularly the case when there is severe osteoporosis. I show you this slide, and I told you that if you give PTH for a short time, 
you achieve bone formation. But if you expose too much the bone to PTH, it will lose bone. So in the ideal, you want a PTH form that is there just for a short time in order to prevent the resorption effects. And also you want to have, in this case, mostly bone effects, and you don't want to, the PTH analog to go too much to the kidney and cause hypercalcemia because these patients with osteoporosis do not have hypocalcemia. So you want to target the bone effects. How can you do this? Well, this is the opposite of the story that I told you. In the other case, I'll, I mentioned that an isoleucine of PTH in position five here allows it to signal it longer. While PTHRP has a histidine that makes the ligand weaker for receptor interactions and signals shorter. So based on the sequence of PTHRP, there was the design of a valoparathide, which is very similar to a PTHRP. And we can see here in these cyclic AMP um, studies in cells that this drug, avaloparatide in red, terminates its cyclic AMP signaling very shortly, much shorter uh, or shorter than PTHRP and much less than PTH or LAPTH. So avaloparatide is a drug that binds very weakly to this R0. It's a very short, um, short, uh, signaling peptide. Here, in this curve, we can see that it's all the way to the left. It's very um, small uh, duration of action and uh, binding. And what are the clinical res res results with this? So um, there was a comparison in patients now with osteoporosis. Would it be better to actually give this avaloparathide than giving other anabolic drugs like theriparathide, which is PTH? And you can see that avaloparathide here increases more the bone density at the hip. And in here, we see the avaloparathide decreases, the, uh, reduces the risk of fractures, of major osteoporotic fractures, compared to placebo, and also compared to teriparathide, which is PTH. There was also less hypercalcemia when you use avaloparathide. So avaloparathide, by having these properties of signaling for a shorter time, for being weaker, is able to have bone effects that are faster without having too many kidney effects. That's why it's a promising drug for the treatment of osteoporosis and is based on these uh, molecular and pharmacologic properties. So this is the part of osteoporosis and what I want to Reemphasize is that PTH actions in the bone can have bone formation or bone resorption if it's prolonged, and that the new drugs that are targeting this RG conformation, which is a more weaker conformation, may be able to achieve more bone formation over resorption. On the last part of the talk, I want to discuss about a PTH analog that does not cause any increase in response at all, but actually decreases the signaling of the receptor, so it's called an inverse agonist, and why this may be useful in clinical practice. So in order to do this, I'm going to use an, the, as an example diseases that are caused by gain-of-function mutations in the PTH receptor. These are very rare diseases, but they have very disabling um, effects for the people that live with them. There are also uh, genetic diseases that lead to loss of function, but I'm not to uh, spend so much uh, time in them. I'm going to discuss these two gain-of-function diseases, Janssen and Eichen. So let's take a look at them. Janssen disease is caused by heterozygous PTH receptor mutations. And the children and adults that live with this disease have these very severe bone deformities here. They are short. They have hypercalcemia because the receptor is too active on the bone. They have kidney stones, and they may progress to renal failure as well. The mechanism of Janssen has been known for years. What happens is that here in cells, if you transfect the mutant receptor, you have a lot of cyclic AMP production, even on the absence of any ligand. 
So these are mutations that allow the receptor to be all the time signaling without any control, without any ligand. Why do these mutations cause this? Well, this is the PTH receptor, and there is an area here in green where all these Janssen mutations are, this green. Here is right where the G protein comes. So these mutations present in patients with Janssen disease open this area of the receptor on the transmembrane domain six to allow the G protein to be all the time there even without a ligand. So G protein receptors function like there's a lock and a key and you need the key to open it. But these mutations allow the, um, this lock to be all the time open without any key. So all the time they are signaling because they affect this part that interacts with the G protein. And you can see that the consequences are very severe. Now I'm showing mice that have the Janssen syndrome. So this is a normal bone growth plate. This is cartilage, this is normal, and here is all the bone. But if you put a Janssen mutation here, you see all this proliferation of cartilage, almost like if they had a tumor and almost no bone. And when you look at how the bones actually look, you see a normal bone, and then the Janssen bone is small. We have these deformities. So these are the consequences of having these overactive receptors. A second disease that is caused by overactive receptors is called ICAN. In this case, what we see here is what we call delay ossification. This is a normal uh, child of one year, as you can see the bones. But in these patients with Ikens, there are no bones because the cartilage are all the time proliferating and not giving room for the bone to form. So it's called delayed ossification. In the Iken mutations are not in the G protein, but actually they affect the interaction with a molecule called beta arresting. So the G protein coupled receptors go activated by G protein and produce cyclic AMP and should be arrested or inactivated by beta arresting. So in this case, the mutation affects how the receptor normally binds to beta arresting, which are the breaks of the receptor. And this promotes more cyclic AMP formation because beta arresting is not able to uh, terminate the response. Similar to Janssen, we can see that there is an increase in chondrocyte proliferation. So this is a normal bone from a mouse, and it has a short growth plate with cartilage. But then it has this mutation present in Iken, and there is a lot of cartilage with very little bone. The difference here is that we knew we were able to rescue this if we only took away the stimulation by the ligand PTHRP. So both Janssen and Iken are gain of function, but one affects the G protein, the other the beta resting. One is all the time active, no matter what ligand is in there, and the other requires the ligand PTHRP. Why do they cause so much problems in these uh, chondrocytes? Well, because PTHRP and its receptor are present at high levels in chondrocytes, and their normal function is to make the chondrocytes proliferate. So when you have this uncontrolled um, stimulation, it leads to more cartilage proliferation and it doesn't allow for the bone to form. So the ideal drug to try to treat this disease will be to uh, give a ligand a PTH form that will bind to the receptor and close it. So instead of a key that opens the lock, you want a key that is locks the, 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 the lock. And this is what an inverse agonist is. So here, I'm going to show you how inverse agonists look. When you have the Janssen receptor, the PTH receptor with the mutation, it's all the time open here at transmembrane domain six, and the G protein is all the time there because the door is always open. But then if you give this inverse agonist, it goes to the receptor and it closes it, so it reduces cyclic AMP. This works at the cellular level, you have here mutants with the ICAN, and they have a lot of cyclic AMP in the ones, the red squares on the top. But if you give the inverse agonist, the cyclic AMP goes down. And this works for Janssen as well. Normally there's a lot of cyclic AMP, you give the inverse agonist, and it goes down. How about in vivo, do they work? 
Here is a model of mouse of Janssen disease. This is a normal bone of a mouse, and this is a bone from a Janssen uh, mouse. It has a lot of this trabecular bone. It's a small, so it's not, not good. You give the inverse agonist, and you can partially restore at least the size and decrease this amount of trabecular bone here. How about for Iken? You have here bones from Iken mouse. First, the normal one here, the growth plate is small. Then the mutant mouse has this expanded growth plate, all this chondrocyte. But if you expose them early on to the inverse agonist or an antagonist to prevent the receptor from being overactive, you can reduce all this expanded growth plate. So both in the Janssen and Iken cases, at least in the preclinical models, we are able to restore some balance by reducing the amount of receptor working. Now, this research on inverse agonists has been going for years at the cellular level and these cyclic AMP studies that I show you. But it was really until recently, thanks to patients that live with Janssen, who pushed to move this research out from the bench into the clinical applications for them. So it's really the faces of patients with this rear bone disease that pushes going from bench to clinical uh, translation. So my take points from this Janssen and Iken syndrome are both are rare form of skeletal disease caused by gain of function. But in the case of Janssen, it's because there is more interaction with G protein, and the case of Iken, less interaction with beta resting. In both cases, the inverse agonist or antagonist of the receptor work to reduce cyclic AMP in the cells, and at least in preclinical models, achieve effects on the bones to try to normalize uh, these uh, deformities. What do I see as perspective moving forward? Well, the PTH receptor is not only in the bone and the kidneys, it's in other pathways. And so targeting in the right way may be um, useful for other diseases, epididymitis here. It's also related to cancer weight loss, the PTHRP. It's also important for cancer metastasis, breast cancer. And obviously in my case as a nephrologist, I want to know how we can use this knowledge and apply for renal osteodystrophy, which we know that, uh, that PTH has a key role on this disease. This work has been going on for years. It started with the cloning of the PTH receptor um, by Dr. Jubner. A lot of work on the inverse agonist by Dr. Gardella for many years at the pharmacological cellular level and then the development of uh, preclinical models. And I want to just end here saying, how did I get into this again? So I was trying to think about calciphylaxis and whether PTH was a problem or was uh, something that, that was useful in kidney disease. I wanted to understand more how the receptor works and then I got into all these rare pediatric diseases, pharmacology, Iken syndrome. There was only one family that had Iken syndrome and inspired us to look into all these beta resting and molecular mechanisms. So it has been not a straight line and I hope one day I will actually make it to the goal, which was originally to look into calciphylaxis, but if not, I hope to continue enjoying this ride on the PTH molecular mechanisms. These are my conclusions. PTH is important for mineral homeostasis. PTHRP is key for organ development, mammary gland, and skin. Location and duration of cyclic AMP matter when you want to know what the actions of the PTH uh, analogs are long-acting for hypoparathyroidism, short-acting for osteoporosis, inverse agonists for diseases like Janssen and Iken. And the future is how can we apply this knowledge for other conditions? In particular, for me, I'm interested in renal osteodystrophy and calciphylaxis. Thank you for your attention. Ignacio, thank you so much for that talk. I think we have time for a couple questions. If we can turn the lights up. Uh, I'll, I'll start with one. I know you want to get back to renal calcification um, and calcinosis. So 
what, what would you need to do to start looking at, at the opportunities for, for these molecules for treatment of renal disease? Yeah. Um, so that's a, a very interesting to me. How do we apply this knowledge for um, renal osteodystrophy? So one of the things I'm more excited about for the inspiration from this ICAN patient is that beta arresting seems to be very important to desensitize the receptor. We knew all that already for many other receptors, but it just became apparent with this disease that is key in, in mediating the actions of the PTH in the bone. So what I want to look now is um, in collaboration with Dr. Thomas Nicholas, who is coming here and who has a lot of... Um, transcriptomics and bone biopsies from patients with CKDs, if any of these desensitization mechanism take place early on on CKD, and if that has any role in generating the PTH resistance that we all see later. We all see that patients with renal disease have PTH on the 500s, 1000s, and their calcium levels are normal or low. Their bone sometimes is not responsive. So can there be some desensitization happening on the bone? That's what I want to figure out with um, Dr. Thomas Nicholas. So, thanks for the talk. Speaking of PTH resistance, in the clinical data you showed for the new long-acting PTH analog, 84 days, but even by 84 days, serum calcium is dropping. Some of these patients are back on calcitriol. Is that PTH resistance, or are there antidrug antibodies developing, or why the waning efficacy? Yeah, that's a very good point, and yeah, the, the question is, in the graph that I show with the new drug, with the late PTH, if you see uh, at almost 90 days, there's a trend towards decreasing the um, calcium levels, and the question is, can this be PTH resistant, or is the drug being ineffective? Obviously, the short answer is, I don't know, but I speculate that PTH resistant may play a role here and will be important to target. Why do I speculate that? When we see cells that are treated with this new LAPTH, it's very profound in the way it brings them the receptors inside the endosomes. And I sell this, or I mention this as a probably good effect because you want that for calcium, but it does may have the counterpart of you are bringing so much the receptors inside that you are desensitizing them. And whether you need to give a break and then do back, we just don't know. For either of the two drugs are very promising but we don't know the side effects on the long term of the bone or how effective are they on the long term. The, uh, the inverse agonist suggests ligand independent activity. Like how, do we, how do we tease apart ligand dependent or ligand dependent activity and its relevance to an effect on treatment of bone? Yes, um, that's a very, uh, the question is, if you were able to use an inverse agonist, that suggests that the receptor has to be active, otherwise there's no point of inverting the agonist. Well, um, the inverse agonist was more relevant initially for diseases of Janssen, which is caused by constitutively active mutations. So Janssen mutations create a constitutively active receptor, and that's why the inverse agonist is important for them. I have to say that even the wild type, the normal receptor, has some level of constitutive activity. It's just not as much as, as Janssen. How do we tease out between them? That was the, the question that I had when I came here bringing these uh, models from MGH with Iken syndrome. I thought, is Iken syndrome also constitutive active? So I deleted the ligand, PTHRP, and the problem was gone. So I knew that for Iken syndrome, it's caused for hyper-responsive to a ligand, while Janssen is a mutation that causes uh, constitutive activity. In both ways, in both cases, this molecule, this uh, inverse agonist, works also as an antagonist. So that's why it's an inverse agonist, but also can work with ICAN, I presume, because it also antagonizes the action of PTHRP. It competes. Dominic? Yeah. It's a really nice talk. It's a very
Yeah, that, that's a very interesting talk. And the question is, is are the bone changes in pregnancy or after pregnancy related to PTHRP? That has been a very attractive hypothesis because as I mentioned, PTHRP is present in the mammary gland and in the placenta. So the hypothesis has been for years, maybe that has to do with why women lose bone and then they gain bone back after pregnancy. I don't think PTHRP has been directly implicated. And in fact, I think it was over this last year that there was a pretty nice comprehensive nature article suggesting that it's a hormone coming from the brain which allows uh, these bone loss and bone recovery after pregnancy. So my understanding is PTHRP doesn't seem the one to be more implicated in these pregnancy changes. Ignacio, thank you so much.